So I'd like to now introduce our keynote speaker for the fall 2021 uh, MSGC uh, conference. Uh, professor Deanna Van Dyke is a professor of geology, geography, and the environment, and the inter interim director of the Dice Mineral Museum, which you'll have an opportunity as well to uh, visit during your lunch break. Uh, she was born in England, uh, but raised in Iowa and Ontario, and attended Redeemer uh, College, where she earned her BCS in math with a geography minor. She then uh, went on to earn her graduate degrees, uh, including her PhD in geography from the University of Waterloo in Ontario, finishing in 1998, and then doing a, a short postdoc in New Brunswick, studying a salt marsh on the Bay of Fundy. So if you haven't been to the Bay of Fundy, that's one of the natural wonders of the world with some of the largest tides uh, experienced there. And then she uh, joined the faculty at Calvin uh, University um, in 1999 and has uh, been studying uh, the geomorphology of dunes, uh, looking at the wind and uh, water that shapes them. And she has become one of the world's leading uh, researchers studying the dunes here on Lake Michigan. And so she's going to tell us uh, about her adventure and her research on dunes. So it is my pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Deanna Van Dyke, our 2021 keynote speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you for the invitation to uh, come to speak at this uh, conference. Thank you all of you who are here and all of you who are watching online for um, being interested in science. And um, I'm not sure if I can say at this point that you're already interested in dunes, but I hope you will be by the time I uh, finish talking uh, today. It is just such an honor to be able to talk about things that I love doing with, uh, with an audience um, that is also participating in science research and in building a knowledge of science in different areas. I would like to give you an outline of what I plan to do in the next little while. And uh, along with the outline, I'm going to give you uh, my goals, which I hope you will join me in sharing some of the goals for this uh, presentation. And so I am going to first say a bit about Michigan uh, dunes. And one of my goals there and uh, through the rest of the presentation um, is that I'm hoping that you'll learn at least one new thing about the dunes, maybe many new things, but I hope that afterwards you can say that uh, there was something that struck you that you didn't know about the dunes. Um, then I'm going to talk about the FIRES project, and I'll explain that acronym uh, as well uh, when we get to that. And research outcomes from the FIRES project. So this is a group of people who have been studying uh, the dunes. And with our focus on, uh, on the Michigan dunes in uh, today's talk, I'm hoping that as you listen, you will make some uh, connections or see some parallels with the work that you are doing in science with your particular areas. So as I'm telling stories of uh, what I and students working with me have been doing, I hope that you will see bits of yourself and there maybe cause you to reflect a bit on what the nature of science is for you. Um, having uh, moved through that, I want to talk about Perseverance Dune, which is uh, just next door to us here and hope that you'll take a minute or two to see that uh, during lunchtime before coming to uh, some conclusions. And uh, after that reflection about uh, what your, the nature of your science has been, as I'm talking about the uh, nature of my science, I'm hoping that you will, will leave uh, this talk with maybe a sense of what stories you would want to tell about your research, what you could share with other uh, people. Uh, I'm going to do my acknowledgments at the beginning of this talk because the pictures that you're seeing and the stories that you're going to be hearing have been supported by, uh, by a number of uh, funding agencies, by uh, a myriad of people who have been working on these projects, and also by a number of sites that have permitted us to uh, do the uh, research. 
Um, so I especially want to acknowledge uh, the initial funding from the National Science Foundation for uh, the FIRES project, but Michigan Space Dance Consortium has been funding this project. We're in our ninth year of a public outreach grant for parts of this uh, project. And uh, that public outreach grant may be different from many of the grants that you are uh, working on here, which are uh, focused on the, the research. Um, I expect that there are a, a number of people, other people here also doing public outreach grants uh, where we're, we're trying to reach uh, people with the exciting stories of science and involve them in science in different ways. Um, and that has been very much appreciated for the FIRES project. Um, there have been a large number of students who have been involved in the FIRES project, more than 200 students up to this point, undergraduate students having deep experiences with, uh, with the science. And so I acknowledge them. They show up in uh, many of the pictures and have helped out with collecting data for uh, many of the results that I'll be talking about. And then I want to acknowledge a, a number of uh, sites in uh, West Michigan, so within good driving distance uh, from our location here that we've been able to go to. And so the pictures of the dunes that you see will be coming from those uh, particular sites. So let me introduce Michigan dunes uh, to you. Actually, let me start by asking for a show of hands. Have you been to a dune in Michigan? And this might be more notable by looking around and seeing somebody who hasn't been to a, a dune in Michigan. If so, make sure that you uh, bombard them with stories of your favorite dunes that they should uh, go to see. Um, so Michigan dunes are a striking landform that are enjoyed by many people that uh, occur. So I've got an inset uh, map here of Michigan uh, pointing to where most of our research has been done. But Michigan dunes occur along the uh, shoreline of Lake Michigan here. Uh, we have uh, dunes along the North Shore of Lake Michigan. There are some dunes along the South Shore of Lake Superior. There are dunes along Lake Huron. On uh, both sides, we see some dunes. But there's some areas where, where dunes are just in greater abundance than other areas because of large uh, sand supplies, good wind. Um, and so Michigan dunes, when we talk about these landforms, we're looking at sand that's been shaped by the wind, that has been uh, blown into position by the wind, and that has wind still acting on it. So having sediments, the sand, having the wind is necessary for the dunes. And many of the dunes that we're looking at here are coastal dunes. And so that coastal environment and the vegetation of that environment is important. So on this picture, you're seeing uh, the dunes in Hoffmaster State Park. And these dunes extend all the way back to this location. So this whole strip here is uh, our dunes. Um, you might be thinking dunes are just places where you can actually visibly see the sand, but a lot of the Michigan dunes are uh, wooded dunes, fully stabilized uh, with forests on top of them. And then this picture uh, shows us very nicely that we have a number of active areas where there's still landform change going on and uh, where we can uh, measure and, um, and study some interesting uh, processes. Now I'm going to uh, take you to the sets of dunes that we see in a main study area. I've outlined it here on the slide. Um, and when I came to Michigan in 1999, well, actually that first year was my first year of teaching full-time. So I think I got out to the dunes twice and that was just to look at them. Uh, so in 2000, really, I started with students uh, doing some investigations on the dunes. And uh, one of the things that I discovered was that despite these being very well known as great landforms, there's actually only a very small research community that was uh, doing research on these dunes. And I got uh, connected very early on with the Hope College researchers. Um, and so uh, we collaborated on some contemporary process studies. Uh, Hope College researchers were very interested in the uh, history of the dunes, and I was very interested, on, in, uh, interested in what is happening with these dunes um, now, and so it was really a good collaboration where we could um, share our results. Uh, but as I was discovering, as I came to this area and I thought, what small area of the dunes can I still learn about because everybody else surely knows everything else, I discovered that the field was wide open in terms of being able to uh, to uh, do some investigations. 
And so I chose uh, with a student researcher, we spent a summer looking for the best site that we could choose. And I actually chose what I thought might be the simplest part of the system to study, because if you have a wide open research area, you might want to simplify a little bit to, um, to be able to actually understand the results instead of having the complications of all the different uh, variables. So you might say, with this array of dunes here, why did I stick so close to the shoreline and look at the smallest dune in the system? That was one of the reasons. It actually ends up not being maybe the simplest dune in the, the system because we get all of the effects of the uh, waves and the lake processes occurring as well. So giving you some, uh, some of your background on uh, dunes, hopefully you'll come out of this being able to identify some different parts of the system. The dune that I was studying is this low mounded dune vegetated mostly with grasses. It's called a four dune. It's called a four dune because as you go from the lake or in ocean coast, as you go in from the ocean and you walk across the beach, it's the first dune, it's the four dune that you would uh, get to as you're walking uh, in, inland. And some people describe it as the, uh, the only true coastal dune because it's the one that's interacting with beach processes and waves may be interacting with it as, as well. Um, so four dune, you would recognize parallel to, to the lake, low dune, a pioneering species on it, uh, and it receives uh, sand when wind blows across the beach, moves that sand inland, and the wind uh, speed decreases at the vegetation, so the sand gets deposited. The foredune grows up in height, or it can uh, grow out in width. And those plants, those amophila, uh, they're, they're wonderful uh, plants that will grow up through the deposits. They can survive a meter of deposition in a year and still grow up through that and, uh, and survive uh, that. We haven't studied that or documented that here, but that's been documented on other uh, Great Lakes posts. Uh, so the, the early years of studies were showing that we were having places on these four dunes that were having 30 centimeters, 40 centimeters, um, in some cases, 50 centimeters of deposition in some years. Grasses were going through that. The four dune was growing um, taller at first, then it started growing wider uh, because lake levels were uh, changing. Now, let me introduce you to some of the other dunes in this dune system as well. And so here on this image, the four dune would be this first dune that is parallel to the shoreline. It's hard to see topography sometimes on these images. Um, the four dune here in this picture, it actually has a bit of a crest here and another crest here. So it first started going here, then it started growing out to the lake. Um, and then in this picture, actually, the four dune is seeing wave erosion on the edge of it. Um, and so that's creating the scarp along the edge. Now, if we go inland, there's another ridge dune in Hoffmaster State Park that extends along the entire four kilometers of the park. And we see that in other areas along the coast as well. Um, it's higher than the four dune, maybe about 10 to 15 meters high. And it's got these characteristics of in some places being rather open grasses, but you could see some trees and there are shrubs and so on this uh, dune ridge. And in other places, this dune ridge has these mature forests on it. Um, so there's been an interesting history there that actually still has not really been studied uh, exactly how that has occurred. And then we see blowouts. We see these bare sand areas, these disturbances where the topography has been lowered because wind erosion is moving the sand from these locations inland. And so we can see evidence of erosion around the blowouts. And uh, whenever we look at a blowout, we also look for the depositional area. We would look downwind uh, to see that depositional area. And so in this picture, you, this is the blowout that I've been studying in the study area, but there's other blowouts and topography from blowouts, some of them with more vegetation on them uh, than other ones. So these blowouts can also heal over time. And then if we go further into the dune system, I'm trying to go further into the dune system, uh, but my clicker, thank you very much, uh, was not working there. Um, so if we go further into the dune system, then we can see these very large parabolic dunes. They're large blowouts. The parabolic dune is indicating a parabolic shape or a U shape uh, to these. And along Michigan's shoreline, these can reach uh, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 meters in height. 
um, and they're spectacular. And when you talk to people along the east coast of, uh, of North America or so, and they, they appreciate their long stretches of dunes that they have, um, they're not looking at anything that is nearly as high as what we're seeing along the Lake Michigan coast. Um, so do appreciate this, do go out, enjoy them, and the view from the tops of these are, are spectacular. Um, this one is uh, a parabolic dune that is very active on the center of it. Sand again like blowouts moving up and over the crest of the dune onto the other side. This dune is advancing slowly over the wooded dunes that are inland uh, from it. So that gives you some of the, the context of the types of dunes that we would see along the uh, Lake Michigan uh, shore. Um, so then uh, just a couple of variables. There are many things that are making these dunes uh, interesting, but one thing that I want to note is the variable of seasonality. Um, that seasons cause different things to be happening at different times of year. And I have four uh, pictures here from the four dune. And if we go uh, through the sequence, I'll just mention a couple of things that we would uh, note for each of these seasons. Um, so if we see the dune in the summer, which quite frankly is when many people are looking at the dunes in the summer because that's when they're at the beach and they're enjoying their uh, vacation time, what you're seeing in that season is generally the lush vegetation, the maximum of the vegetation. Um, you're actually not seeing a lot of sand movement because in Michigan, the variable winds are uh, slightly lower in the summer. And so uh, many of the wind speeds are not sufficient to move the sand. Um, you do see in the summer a, a fair bit of human impacts. A lot of people doing their recreation in, in the area. Um, and so you would see footprints on the beach and pathways over the, uh, the vegetated dunes. Um, and, and so uh, that's the picture maybe many people have of the dunes. When we get into the, uh, the fall and winter, wind speeds pick up. And so these are the seasons that seem to be the greatest change for the dunes but the characteristics of the dunes are also changing. The vegetation is undergoing seasonal dieback. And so that vegetation that was trapping sand very close to the edge of the dune is now uh, letting sand move uh, further into uh, the dune system. And the sand that's moving into the dune system is, is starting to cover over some of that vegetation so the sand can start to travel a bit further. But the autumn storms also bring a lot of variability. They bring rain with them. They can bring, uh, push the waves further onto the beach. And so that can decrease the beach area, which is supplying the sand um, to the, the dunes. So there's a lot of activity, but there are variables which promote sand moving, active winds, strong winds and storms, and variables which inhibit sand movement, which might be the moisture that we see um, in the sand. In the winter, we could say the same thing. There are strong winds in the winter time and a lot of movement occurs uh, during the winter. But in the winter, we have additional variables of snow. Now wind can also blow snow off of surfaces. So it's not a permanent uh, buffer for wind acting on the surfaces. And we have the variable of ground freezing and ground freezing does cement the sand into place, but sublimation of that ice that's cementing the sand grains will release those grains and wind can pick the grains up and can move them into the dune system. And so what you're actually seeing in this uh, picture here are mixes of snow and sand deposits. They're called Nivo Aeolian deposits that show that both snow and sand has been moving. Sometimes you get kind of a, a, a layered effect. Some people have described it like butterscotch ice cream, uh, butterscotch ripple ice cream. Um, so you get those types of effects and you can still see that uh, sand is moving and change is happening. In the winter, slopes also tend to steepen up because uh, of the ground freezing. And so in the spring, when things start to thaw out, it actually becomes kind of messy, kind of soggy out there. The water inhibits uh, sand movement, but those slopes and the sand that has piled up, those start to adjust and uh, kind of slump down in place to give us then the more rounded form that we would typically see uh, during the summer months. And so I'd encourage you to go out to the dunes in any season and enjoy uh, what, what is happening within those seasons. Now, the other variable that I would like to talk about is the variable of lake level, because the four dune that I was studying since uh, 2000, and the estimate is that that four dune probably started being formed in about 1998 or 1999, 
So I was very young when I started to uh, study that. Um, that foredoon was growing through 2013. And then as lake levels came up, uh, significant erosion started to take place. And so you're seeing um, part of the foredoon that's left here, but you're seeing these scarps that are a result of that wave erosion and storms. And the foredoon that I had been studying since 2000, in November 2019, the last remnants of that foredoon were removed in a, a big storm uh, just before Thanksgiving. Um, so one could say my life's work up to that point had just disappeared um, in that last storm. Of course, I can always find something else to study. Now we're looking at erosion occurring on the dune ridge, which is just a little uh, inland from that. And the variable that we would be looking at here I apologize. There we go. The variable that we are uh, looking at here is uh, lake levels, which have this pattern, this uh, lake level curve are the direct measurements, the historic record, starting in 1918, we're going up to 2020 here. You could see the average indicated with the line that's going across the this, this screen. And these lake levels have this natural variability uh, highs and lows within that time period. And some of the lows, this low here in the 1960s was a time when actually a number of houses went up along the lake shore. Um, and then in the 1970s and 1980s and 1990s, those were time periods where there was a lot of erosion and a number of a lot of damage to houses along the lake shore as those lake levels came up. And then my study period here, I began studying in about 2000. And we can see this extended time period of low lake levels. So that was when the foredoon was growing. And then in 2013, lake levels started to go up and they went up and we actually had a monthly uh, record for the high lake levels. We haven't had an annual uh, record for, for the high lake levels um, that was higher back here. Uh, but we had a monthly record. So these lake levels went up quite fast and um, and that was what was interacting with the dunes. Now this variability is natural. It has to do with how much precipitation we're getting into the lake basins, how much evaporation is uh, taking water out of the uh, lake basins. And um, currently lake levels are starting to go down a bit. Um, I wouldn't want to predict whether they will keep on going down or whether they will go back up. Um, but I do want to study what happens when the lake levels do wh whatever they are uh, moving towards. And so this has become a big contextual variable uh, that has uh, determined some of the different processes that we're seeing along the lakeshore. All right, I wanna move at this point to talk about uh, engaging a group of students with these types of studies um, in a different way. So in about the first 10 years that I was studying these dunes, I was doing this in um, more traditional research models that were, uh, that involved working with a couple of students in the summer as uh, summer student researchers or working with students through the academic year and they were doing the research uh, part time. The first year research in our sciences project changed that model to include a class of students, a course that's offered every fall um, to include uh, roughly 24 students every year in the research. And these students who are involved in the research are first year students. And that was a deliberate choice to try to engage students early in experiencing science and being able to then decide if this was something that they wanted to continue on in or, um, or if this was something that did not match with their, their uh, vocational goals. Um, so the first year research in earth sciences uh, program or the FIRES program immerses students in studying about science by doing science and the science that students are doing is a research on the Lake Michigan dunes. And in this uh, slide, you're seeing a number of uh, students, they're using equipment here. This is, uh, this is one of our most intensive uh, projects in one of our lab days where we have multiple small teams working on different uh, parts of the study. The team that you're seeing in the foreground here um, we both have students who are setting up these anemometers and wiring them in and students who are setting up sand traps to measure how much sand is uh, moving. 
And uh, in this picture, we have both first year students and we have a group of upper level students who are mentoring this experience. So the upper level students are getting their own uh, research experience. And so these two cohorts or these two target audiences are being engaged in uh, science and getting an insider perspective on what science is. Uh, I want to note that the students who take the FIRES course, these are both students who are interested in science, and these are students who are not interested in science or who have not indicated that as an interest. In fact, some of these students um, will say, usually not right at the beginning, but maybe four weeks in, they'll say, I never liked science in high school. And they say it with a note of surprise because they discover that they're liking science as part of the uh, FIRES course. Um, so the non-science students are taking the course as science core, and they will become better citizens for understanding science. So they're increasing their science literacy. The students who are interested in science are trying out this experience uh, because it can help them with some of their vocational choices later on. Do they want to go into the geosciences or the biological uh, sciences or chemistry or, or physics? Um, they're trying out some of these experiences. And then the mentors are more experienced students. They've had a research experience in their past. Um, typically, they're juniors or seniors, although we have had sophomore mentors. And they're earth science majors. And so they are uh, working as team leaders. They're mentoring the younger students or the more novice students in their science experiences. And, um, and they, the mentors are having their own deeper research experience. They start earlier and they continue their experience into uh, the next semester. And so this program is reaching students at two points in their educational or career pathway. One is when they might be deciding what major they're going to take. And another point for the mentors is when they've decided on the major and they're looking towards the next steps, are they going into grad school? What disciplinary focus are they choosing? Um, do they want to continue to do field work or do they want to do other types of work? Um, so we engage uh, two cohorts in research in different ways. And the uh, structure and the approach of the course is to start with that dune experience. Start with being at the dunes and exploring what's going on at the dunes. So in this sequence, we start with the exploration and then uh, both by reflecting on that exploration and with classes that give vocabulary, that give content, uh, we make sense of that, uh, that exploration. Then we apply that in the next lab uh, or we apply that uh, later on in research uh, projects um, to further that development. So it's a circle that we uh, keep on going through. The projects that we do are, uh, are, are occurring during the second part of the semester. So in the first part, we build skills. We have just started into our research projects for this uh, particular year. So we have about seven uh, weeks for the research projects. And these are done by teams that are led by a mentor and that have approximately four students, uh, could be three in some years, we've had five or, or six students in some of the uh, projects. The topics are given to the mentors before the semester and uh, to the students. So the topics are given, but the student teams do all of the research design, the data collection, the data analysis, and then communicating the results. So the students for this semester are headed towards a poster presentation and a conference style oral presentation um, to, that's open to the community at the end of the uh, semester. And then the mentors will go on to do a conference presentation next semester. So they'll do some more analysis of the data and they will write the research report on the projects. And uh, here are a couple of examples of some of the types of projects that we do. We look at things like this uh, rare plant, plant, the pitcher sisal, that is listed as on the federal list as a threatened species. And it needs a certain level of disturbance. And so we've been looking at the environmental conditions for it. Where does it occur? What are the patterns uh, for that? And we've done a few projects on that. We've looked at management uh, effectiveness. In this case, uh, a park that has some steep slopes in it um, and a certain uh, type of a fence type and the student research team decided that those fences were not effective, both because of the uh, fence materials and because the steep slopes were actually causing a lot of sand to slide under these fences. Uh, we have looked at uh, 
topics that are of more scientific uh, um, interest. So I would say the, the last project that I talked about, the uh, sand fences, that was of interest to the dune managers. They were wondering, were those sand fences effective? They actually went out the next year and put a different type of sand fence in along with some planting of vegetation. So they changed their management strategy based on that. But we also have student teams that are working with this general understanding of uh, the dunes, such as what effects do autumn storms have on the four dunes? And so doing a deep dive into that topic for a couple of particular autumn storms. And then uh, this last uh, example that we have here, our management efforts succeeding at stopping a large dune from advancing towards a road is a project that we've revisited a number of, of times and contributed information there. It's a project that started with the human impacts on that, that dune. And so that's our third area that we would look at is how are humans impacting these dunes. In terms of the research outcomes, uh, I could start by uh, giving some numbers or some ranges of numbers. Uh, we have in terms of uh, getting these results out to the scientific community and the dune management community, uh, we have now over the past uh, 10 years, more than 60 conference presentations. And it's uh, a few more of those are poster presentations than uh, oral presentations, uh, but it, it's uh, very close to half and half in terms of uh, those numbers. Um, and so we're reporting on these results to the scientific community. We also have uh, more than 50 research reports, which we uh, post on our website that are making uh, information available to the dune management community about the results uh, for the different projects. And so we're accumulating a body of knowledge about the, the dunes and about what we're, what we're learning about them. And some of the topics that we're doing, especially for the research reports and the conference presentations, do not rise yet to the level of being able to do a, a journal article, uh, peer reviewed article, but we are getting the results out to people who can use information such as this management technique. What do we know about this in our early exploration of uh, what's going on with um, studying sand fences, for instance, or what are we learning about that pitcher sisal plant? Now I'm gonna change tracks here a bit because I would also say we've got some outcomes in terms of understanding science. And here I would like to acknowledge that I'm drawing uh, uh, from my phrasing at the bottom of these slides and some organization of these thoughts from a website called Understanding Science that was an NSF funded uh, project um, that is readily available for teachers and for others. And you will see the citation for that coming up on a, um, I think two or three slides from now, the citation will come up uh, with a diagram that comes out of that, that project. And here is where I would invite you to continue reflecting as you've been thinking about your research as I've been talking about our research, but to think about your science experiences and to see are these things that resonate also with the experiences that you have had in science. And if it sounds like, yeah, this is common sense, of course this is happening. What we're basically doing on these slides is just naming what we do in science, but some of what we're naming here is not what the general public expects science to uh, look like. And so uh, one of the things that we see from the science that we're doing um, and that is uh, supported that there's evidence from science in many other places as well, is that science is both a body of knowledge and it's a process. And so the first year research students and the upper level research students and myself, as somebody with a PhD who's been uh, studying these dunes for a number of years, um, all of us are participating in increasing the body of knowledge through science, but we're also going through the process of science. And I'm learning things about myself uh, as I do different uh, projects, uh, but maybe my gains are not as great as first year students learning about themselves as they are uh, encountering science uh, and field research, maybe for the first uh, time in this hands-on way, as they are having many frustrations. I won't ask you to raise your hand if you have never had a frustration in your scientific process, uh, but perhaps you could think of one or two roadblocks, dead ends, 
re research data that did not go in the direction that you thought it would something that you thought would take a couple of minutes and it took many, many hours. These are the real experiences that the FIRE students are having uh, in their research, but they're also having moments of seeing that graph finally that says something that they've learned that nobody else has known before, or being out in the environment and seeing a process occur that they had read about or heard about before, but now they're actually seeing it take place and they're noticing something new about that process. So the joy of discovery is also a part of uh, the science. And we are also seeing that science is ongoing. And so here I want to talk for uh, just a couple of minutes about this North Beach Dune. And this uh, project, uh, began or our involvement in it began in 2004. So this is way before the fires uh, project started. And it was a student research project in the summer. And it began because uh, the managers in Ottawa County had heard that there was somebody in Hoffmaster State Park, which is just down the road uh, from this park, who was studying dunes, and they had a problem with this one. And the problem that they had was that this road that curves around here, um, people in the community were noticing that occasionally there was sand on the road. And their concern was, does the sand on the road mean that the dune is heading towards the road? And if they kind of follow that logical conclusion, if the dune is heading towards the road, is it going to uh, go over the road and cut off the ability for people to go down this road? And this road is the only access road for a neighborhood of houses in this direction and you can see all these houses in this direction, there's about 300 houses that this is their only access road. Uh, so this became an important question. And a sub question of this was, if the dune is moving towards the road, is this because there are human impacts on the dune or is this a natural process of the dune? And so this is the windward slope of this large parabolic dune. And the student researcher, the one who was tasked with the study and a research assistant who was doing another study but was participating here as the research assistant, um, over that summer, uh, they uh, mapped out the dune, they looked at evidence of human impacts and evidence of natural dune processes, and they uh, concluded that they couldn't tell which was more dominant, but both were going on. So they couldn't tell relative proportions of those, but they could tell that both were going on and that human impacts were significant. And uh, with the fortunate occurrence that the managers had put some monitoring posts on the other side of the dune a few years before, um, they were able to look at the data and say that the dune was moving in the direction of the road and was moving at about 0.67 meters per year, which is about two feet per year. And without some terribly difficult calculations, they measured that the dune was about 12 meters from the road. And so in about 18 years, the dune would start to uh, go over the road if it kept on moving at the same rate that it was uh, going. And then as a result of that study, we also looked at the literature and we said, here are a bunch of management strategies that other people are using that you could possibly use too. And based on our knowledge, here are some of the ways that you could uh, implement these strategies. Now, in this uh, slide, we're looking at this dune in 2010, and they pretty well threw, the managers threw everything at the dune. They put sand fences across the dune. They planted vegetation on the top of the dune. They put a boardwalk that they extended all the way around the dune. And so the sand fences will stop people from trying to run down or climb up the dune. And that was some of the heavy impacts. The boardwalk will get people to the top without them having to walk through the center of the dune. The vegetation, uh, the planted beach grass there is to try to stabilize the slope. And all of this on this slope, because the sand moving towards the road is sand that was coming up and over and going down. So if you try to stabilize that other slope of the dune, that's actually not that effective because that's not the source of where the, the sand is coming from. And in, when we started fires research, we had some projects that went to look at, is this dune being stabilized? And a 2012 project measured an advance rate of that dune at zero meters per year. It was way faster than I ever expected the uh, management to actually have an effect. And we actually see it's a bit variable in terms of the rate. So there's still some slow advance going on, 
uh, but these management efforts have made an impact on this dune. And we wouldn't necessarily say that you would want to uh, stabilize every dune that you come to. You have to look at your broader context and say, are there good management reasons to uh, stabilize a dune? Uh, but we certainly, as fire projects, we have appreciated uh, looking at this dune and being a participant and seeing how effective the strategies are and, effect, and uh, seeing what's going on with these dune processes. Um, so this is an example of a, a project where we keep on picking up little pieces of the project and contributing uh, more information to the understanding of this, this dune. Another uh, point that we see in our understanding of science um, is something that I would probably describe as simply science is messy. Um, and maybe I would add to that science is messy, but it's fun uh, when we get into it. Um, but I could say that um, in, in better language here, borrowing from the Understanding uh, Science Project, that the real process of science is complex, it's iterative, and it can take many different paths. And uh, you may know, some of you may still be working with a model for science that is that linear model of the scientific process. That you start with a question and you work through a couple of stages and eventually you come to your, your conclusions. And scientists um, suggest and their experience bears out um, that science tends not to be linear. And that sometimes when we try to approach something with that linear process in, in mind, we can get uh, confused or baffled by the roadblocks that we encounter along the way. Now, for this uh, particular slide, I uh, chose the diagram from the Understanding Science site um, that is the simpler diagram. They have an interesting uh, diagram that has uh, information within each of these uh, circles, and that information have, has pathways that go forward and backward and go in all directions. Even with this diagram, we can see that that may be your curiosity, your exploration, which will lead you to test the ideas and to gather the evidence for it, uh, that we've got some forward motion and some backward motion, and we've got some interactions with these other parts of, of science. Um, and so if you think about your pathway to your particular project that you are describing here today, and think about, did that only go in one direction or did you have to backtrack? Did you have to refine your ideas? You may, uh, you may see whether you fit also into this particular uh, diagram of science uh, has multiple pathways to getting to some of the answers that we get to. We've got the, uh, the communal experiences that we share. We gather evidence. We don't just draw conclusions from our initial ideas or our initial exploration. Um, but when we come to the end of the project, um, we may have done that in a different way than somebody else working on a, a, a different project. We also know very well that science is done in, a, in community. And here's an example of just one of our years of uh, FIRES classes uh, where we have included in this picture the first year students and uh, the mentors mixed in with the first year students. And this uh, kind of flies in the face of maybe one of the myths out there that science is a solitary activity undertaken by scientists, maybe working alone in their lab. And that generally is not borne out by our experiences. Um, we have a, a community of the people that we work with directly. They may be part of our group. They may be collaborating groups that we're working with. And we're also part of the larger scientific community where we are building on research that other people have done. We're communicating our research so people coming after us can build on our results as well. So science is a communal activity. And then we can also say that science is embedded in and it's influenced by society. And so I'm going to first come back to this North Beach dune. And this is a look at this dune in 2018. So I'm moving us forward in time. And we're looking just at the windward slope of that. And you can see from that very bare windward slope when, uh, when uh, things first started, now there's a lot of vegetation. There are still some blowout areas on the dune, um, but this is a much more stabilized dune on this side than it is on the other side. 
And I've taken you through that story of the societal questions in that area that both prompted the initial research project and the results of that research project contributed back to managers' decisions about the dune that have uh, prompted a lot of these strategies on the dune. And one of the current issues or interesting questions about this dune is that that rare dune plant, the pitcher thistle, was on this dune and it was um, in past years seen kind of on the lower part of the dune that's not really in this picture, but a lower part of the dune that had some bare sand areas and so had just about the right level of disturbance for that plant to grow. But with stabilizing the dune, that stabilization is also affecting the level of disturbance in different areas of this dune. And so one of the consequences of stabilizing a dune could be that we are um, taking away the habitat, the environment that this rare plant needs to grow in. Now, something that's interesting is pitcher sisal, which was in this area, but we never saw it in the bare sand area up here. Now we are seeing pitcher sisal in this area. And so some of our projects have moved to studying what's going on with that pitcher sisal, because now we have a level of disturbance in this area that is appropriate for the pitcher sisal. And one of the questions, uh, the future questions for Perseverance Dune, which is just beside us, is actually a question of, can we create an environment where we could manage it for just the right level of disturbance for pitcher sisal to actually survive in that environment? Um, prompted by noticing the patterns on this dune and talking to managers about their concern about losing habitats for pitcher sisal. Oh, I want to back up just a minute for the other photo that we're seeing in uh, this slide. Um, this is a photo that we all know as a big uh, societal influence on our science over the last two, two years. A global pandemic does change the context of the science that you're working in. And I think many here uh, may have uh, stories of how their work has been affected by the pandemic over the last uh, couple of years. And uh, it, if it changes the nature of how we're doing the work, there are different responses to those types of changes. And some of those responses might be uh, to delay work or to pursue different types of work that, um, that can be done within the context of the pandemic. And there are uh, many scientists that are also studying what's going on with the pandemic. What can we learn about from tracing our pathway through this uh, pandemic? Well, this brings me to the case study of Perseverance Dune. And Perseverance Dune is the artificial dune on Kelvin's campus uh, that is just beside the Prince Conference Center. And Perseverance Dune did not exist before August two, 2020. And it is a direct response to COVID-19. And it is a response to that within the FIRES program because as we were coming out of March, April, and May out of the spring semester of 2020, and looking ahead to the fall semester of 2020, then I was faced with the question of uh, having a hands-on field research-based science experience for first-year students, how to do that safely within the global pandemic. And at that point in time, field trips, getting a number of people into a van in close quarters with each other to drive out the 50 minutes that it would take to get to the Lake Michigan dunes, at the early part of that summer, that was just not looking possible uh, for us to do. And so I was wrestling with how do we still do the science in the fall when we can't do these field trips to the Lake Michigan dunes? And I was not wrestling with, can we do science? Because that was just a, a foundational principle. We can still do science. We can do beautiful dune research by working with computer generated data. What I was wrestling with was that might not be as much fun for first year students to start their science experience with computer data versus being out in, uh, in the environments. How can I still get that hands-on field experiences? And the idea for building a dune on campus came from one of those kind of serendipitous moments when I was uh, walking, kind of puzzling over this and thinking about, all right, you know, how can I get these students out to the dune safely? What, you know, uh, you know, everything from one person per vehicle and we drive in a bevy of vehicles out there, like what can we do? to get them out there. And 
my the serendipitous moment was thinking, well, if we can't bring students to the dunes, can we bring a dune to the student? And that changed everything because at that point in time, then my mind and many other people that I uh, engaged with that question started working on how do we make this possible? Like, is it possible? And what would it look like? And once we started to say, what would it look like? What would it take? Then we could answer, yes, we can do this or no, we can't do this. So what did it take? It took 630 tons of sand um, at a cost of just under $8,000 for that sand. Um, Michigan Space Grant was wonderful, not in terms of funding all of that, but in terms of allowing us to use what had been granted for transportation costs to the Lake Michigan dunes to be repurposed to buying sand. And we also found some other uh, funding uh, internally that went towards um, the sand. And we put this sand on an existing uh, slope. So you can see here, it's a grass, what was a grassy slope. And this is just kind of the day of, I think it's the morning after the sand was uh, put onto that slope. And so what we were building was a dune area. And with our knowledge of dunes coming in many uh, shapes and sizes, this dune area would give us an opportunity to, to do some things and to study dune processes. Um, this definitely in this picture, this is an artificial dune. This is not a dune yet. Um, and we're maybe puzzling over the philosophy of, of at what point do we say we've actually transitioned to a real dune, which would be a pile of sand that's shaped by the wind. So, um, so wind has been uh, working on this dune, uh, but its origins are definitely artificial. And uh, we added, um, and this was also, I think of this as serendipitous, when I started talking to people on campus about permissions for doing this, I got an email from one of our biologists saying, I've heard about your project. I've got dune plants in the greenhouse. I'm saving them all for you. So I was not expecting to have plants on the dune, but we had plants, dune plants that we could put onto the dune that added to that experience. And so you could see these uh, students here uh, actually measuring, they're doing quadrats of these dune plants, uh, which was a, a better learning experience that we had done in some previous years where our practice quadrats had to be of lawn grass and, uh, and other things. Um, and, and so this year when we're back at the Lake Michigan dunes, we still use this as a practice location for practicing methods and for uh, working on uh, projects. Um, and you're also seeing here students that are uh, setting up research projects on the dune. And this was an opportunity for us to measure a number of things last year, such as how is this dune similar or different from dunes along Lake Michigan? So we looked at grain size and, and behavior. How is this dune adjusting to autumn storms? And so we looked at sand transport and we looked at wind patterns on the dune. And the uh, students in uh, this picture are putting in some sand traps to see how much sand was uh, moving on the dune. And we could do an experiment that we could never do out on the Lake Michigan dunes, which was uh, putting in some plots of different densities of plants and seeing how they responded in the fall. So recent plantings, how would they uh, trap sand or not trap sand? And the students with great delight set up one of their plots that they could trample it. And so we did some deliberate trampling to see how would that disturbance actually interact with these plants uh, as a strategy for uh, managing a, a dune. Um, and then uh, I can also say with this slide that uh, we have an unexpected future for this dune as well. When I was proposing this project, I proposed it as a one-year project and had to have a kind of a sand removal plan at the end of that. Um, but in the meantime, and actually from very early on in the project, uh, there are people on campus who have been interested in keeping this dune longer term. And of course, I'm one of those people on campus interested in keeping this uh, dune around. And so the ecosystem preserve is taking over some of the educational outreach that will happen from the dune, uh, for, for the dune. And so they're including it in their uh, maps of places to go see. And uh, we've got a uh, uh, a plan for putting in some additional signs in November of this year, uh, so people can identify some of the different plants that you see on the uh, dune. 
And we actually, uh, both for the ecosystem preserve and for future research, uh, we added sand this summer to Perseverance Dune. And so I won't show you a picture of that here, but when you go out to the dune now, we've added a blowout feature. So we've added some height for the ecosystem preserve so that they would have a, uh, a, a dune area that people could more readily identify as a dune. People want to look for those crests of, of dunes. But also, we're starting to plant vegetation around it so that we can do some longer term experiments on can we manage a blowout to a specific level of stability. Here, unlike many of the Lake Michigan dunes, if we think that we have things getting too stabilized, we can trample or we can pull out plants um, and we can add plants to, to the system as well. And so that project has just started on the uh, blowout. Uh, Dune. We also have a restoration ecology course this fall that is working with some of the unexpected um, outcomes of Perseverance Dune. And one of those unexpected outcomes was that we saw a lot of water erosion. And the, we see the water erosion because this water can't just go through the sand as it typically does, but the water hits the uh, soil underneath it, which has a lot of clay, and that moves the water sideways. And so we probably saw more sand being moved by water than being moved by wind over the last year. But if you go out to the dune now, you'll see a bioswale arrangement that the restoration ecology class is putting in and is testing out to see if that will take care of some of the uh, water erosion uh, problems. So you will see a, a dune uh, with research and management activities in process. So to conclude then, uh, what can we learn about sciences from Michigan dune research? I'm using the same image that I used at the beginning of the talk, because I just want to point out that this is one of the smallest types of dunes that actually have a name. It's called a shadow dune, and it's where a, a plant, in this case it's the Amophila, it's the beach grass, blocks the wind. So we can tell that the wind was coming from this direction. It uh, decreases when it uh, gets into the plant and then it deposits the sand downwind from the plant. And so we get this small dune feature that's being built up and it's being built up grain of sand by grain of sand. And this could become a much larger dune. In fact, this is often the beginning of a four dune. And lake levels have started going down and we actually have some projects this fall to see if we're starting to see incipient four dunes, baby four dunes forming along the lake shore. So we're, uh, we're working with the variables that we have and working on advancing the science that way. Um, and so I think this is a nice image of being able to conclude that both the process and outcomes of building knowledge are important. That a community of researchers is building the knowledge on Lake Michigan dunes and on Michigan artificial dunes now, and a community of researchers building the, uh, the knowledge in your field of study as well. And telling our stories is part of communicating science to broader audiences, telling our stories of how science is communal, how science can be messy, but we can come to good conclusions, how we can have a societal problem like a global pandemic and we can figure out how to be creative and continue doing our science and that creativity is a part of of science is not something that's just done in other fields but it's a big part of the science that we do these are all things that might not strike the general public as their typical image of science but it's important for us to talk about our experiences of science thank you all very much Thank you very much. We now have time for questions about uh, dunes or the fires project, or also uh, if we have time, uh, if you could describe the Dice Mineral Museum. Yes. And, uh, yes, <laughs> I'll repeat that question. So the question is about the upper level students. What are they reporting on their experiences and 
kind of the impacts of their experiences on, on uh, science. Um, we have a, 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 a smaller um, data set in terms of our upper level students. So some of the types of questionnaires that we've been able, the exit questionnaires we've been able, able to do for the first year students, um, we, we can't do that well with the upper level students because we have six per year and it's hard not to identify them from the, from the data that they do. So I'm going to report more on um, anecdotal uh, information and also some of the numbers that we're seeing. Um, so we, we are hearing uh, some of the students decide to go to grad school when they didn't see that as a, as a career choice before. And, um, and we are seeing um, significant numbers of our upper level students going on to graduate school in, uh, in the geosciences. Um, so the disciplines they come out of are geology, uh, geography, we also have some environmental science and environmental studies uh, students. And sometimes when they go on to grad school, they actually, um, so some of them, especially our environmental science studies students and geography students might actually uh, slightly change their uh, direction within the earth science. The geology students tend to go to uh, geology uh, graduate programs. Um, so, so we see them going on to graduate school or taking on uh, employment positions within their fields. And we hear the students uh, telling us that um, that the, the lessons that they learned or the experiences that they had both helped them to make some decisions about what they were going to be doing, but also gave them the portfolio that was very competitive when they were going on to the graduate program. So being able to say that they had uh, research presentations, uh, technical report, those types of experiences, and being able to say that they had done some small, small group teaching as well out of the field and had some team leadership experience was very valuable for them. Yes. Oh, this is Dottie from Rector. Uh, I was wondering if you have that in the research on the science letter to the LUS of their graduate students pre or post survey to see how things change uh, over the time of your two years. Um, I, I would say that we have collected some. Um, some data using, especially in the first years, using some of the um, kind of uh, standard tests that were out, out there. So David Lopato and some of the work that he was um, doing uh, with that. Um, but, um, but I would say that our, our results, so we can look at, at some of those pre post uh, changes. Um, it's harder in, in how we're interpreting those uh, those results. Um, so I wouldn't say that we we say, oh, we're seeing the stunning significant change from the beginning of course um, to the end of the course. And what we've also been tracking has been how students have been coming out of the uh, course and then what majors they've been deciding on later. And some of the difficulties that we've been having in terms of being able to report on this is identifying what is uh, significant coming out of this experience directly attributable to this experience versus the other experiences that students are, are having. Um, so our pre-post uh, testing with some of those measures, I would say we've got some data from the early years. Right now, we're still looking for a better test. So I'd probably like to talk with you if you have some knowledge about that, of what, what a good pre-post uh, test would be uh, since David Lopato discontinued uh, what he's doing, um, and uh, we we're more getting anecdotal evidence at this point in time. Yes. Okay. Yep. I'll repeat your question. Okay. Right. Um, so in, in terms of a community interest, we see the community interest uh, both on sites that we're at. So students getting that opportunity to interact with somebody who's walking past to do an area that they're, they're coming into and asking questions. So that's such a valuable experience for the, the student, but also the community members are saying, oh, that's interesting. You know, can, 
kind of can I see the results or what are you learning about this. We're inviting community members to our, our presentations. So we're uh, every year getting some community members who will come, who will ask questions, who will uh, in the question period um, answer, like share some of their own experiences as well. And often they'll propose topics that they would like us to, um, to kind of work on next or have we considered that. Um, we actually get some good ideas uh, from that as well. In terms of uh, the, the kind of the uh, pipelines or the younger educational experience, the, the K through 12, um, we have no kind of formal arrangements with, with any particular uh, group there. So uh, we are definitely, we're recruiting from students who are in their junior or senior year of high school. And we're recruiting out of the students who are deciding whether they're gonna come to Calvin University or not. Um, so there, a measure of the, the interest or the success of our recruiting is that students are coming into our, our programs. Um, it would be very interesting to take some of this information into classrooms. Um, I think these stories are exciting to, to be able to portray um, to students. And uh, the difficulty would just be, how do we fit that in on top of everything else that we're doing? So the focus so far has been on giving this deep experience for the undergraduate students in the program. Um, and then uh, with our uh, website and other uh, materials trying to share that that story um, and I think there's definitely room for us to do more trying to figure out how to do it effectively is is the uh, question Saginaw Valley State University um, so uh, my question is um, once we go back to normal hopefully soon are you still planning to conduct as much research on this artificial perseverance that you want, that you are doing right now and um, over a long period of time to do so, are you expecting some different results than you would um, expect from the natural zone? Yeah, those are, are great questions. And um, we are, this year we have gone back to the Lake Michigan dunes for five out of our six research projects. So we have one research project that is still focused on Perseverance Dune. And that project is actually focused on the new blowout that we, uh, I have the artificial blowout that we've created on the dune, and that project is comparing the artificial blowout on Perseverance Dune to some natural blowouts along the lakeshore. Um, so it's a combined uh, project. I anticipate that over the next uh, couple of years, number of years, that we uh, will probably continue to do one project a year that's at Perseverance Dune or is focused on Perseverance Dune. Um, and apart from the projects, I'm heavily using Perseverance Dune in teaching. So I teach some classes out at the dune as opposed to on PowerPoint saying, this is what sand, like, you know, what sand does and what a dune looks like. We can actually uh, be out on the dune. And we're doing some of our uh, initial labs earlier in the semester. We're doing those uh, out at the dune as well, using that uh, for, for research. Um, so I anticipate not the everything was focused on Perseverance Dune last year type of approach in the future, but a lower level of continuing the research on the Dune. And I think this will be the last question probably. This is uh, Bridget Corbin from Western Michigan University. I'm just wondering, is this a model that you would use or allow to be used at other universities? Or let's say um, you know, primary age uh, grade students or um, school district campuses? Uh -huh. Uh, very interesting. So is this a model to be used at other places or with younger um, students? And, uh, and I was going to say a wholehearted yes to the first part, and then you said the younger students, and now I'm not uh, um, not sure. So, uh, so let me answer on a couple of levels. The FIRES model for involving uh, first year students or really any level of students at the undergraduate level in research um, is a model that I would wholeheartedly uh, be delighted to work with anybody in implementing that at their own uh, institution. And I think the FIRES model it uh, does not have to be on dunes. The model works if you take the research area of the primary instructor, or even if you change it up with some different research areas. So, 
So it works for dunes for me because that's my research area, which means I can develop the topics and guide the students. Um, and it would be delightful if uh, people kind of adopted that to their research area and some of the same structure will work for that. Um, for younger age students, I would uh, say a wholehearted yes to involving students in research, in hands-on research as a way of understanding science, but I would need to take some time to think about whether the FIRES model has elements that would work for that age group or would not work uh, for that age group. Um, and I simply haven't thought about that. So I'd, I'd like to say a, a tentative yes. Um, I, I know when I was starting the project that uh, I was hearing some uh, people say in some venues and not directly related to the project, but hearing people suggest that um, that undergraduate research needed to have a certain level of background. So first year students were not equipped to do undergraduate research because they didn't have the course background to be able to, uh, to do the level of research that was needed. And, uh, and my response to that and the project shows that first year students can do great research, but I'm also very careful in terms of uh, what I set as the expectations for our research and um, and choosing the topics carefully as well. So, um, so I would, if I apply that to younger age groups, I would say um, younger age groups can be involved in doing great things in research, but I, if I was developing a program, would need to uh, appropriately uh, kind of scale it to what students at that knowledge level are able uh, to do. We also see in terms of citizen science models that uh, we can engage a lot of uh, people without science background in collecting great data and contributing to great uh, great research uh, projects if we um, create those projects appropriately. So it was a complicated answer to your question. And we have one more question. Okay. Yeah, Right. Uh, that's a great question uh, because it was uh, very important as an early part of the project, actually, that we not get Michigan dune sand for the dune on campus um, because of the stewardship issues. Uh, and then, along with the, I mean, the stewardship issues were guiding us, but it's also a public relations nightmare to say we're building a dune on campus and we, you know, harmed another dune on the shoreline to actually get the sand. So the sand is from a pit in the Grand Rapids area. And uh, some of our studies are to look at what are the, the, um, the characteristics of that sand compared to Michigan beach sand. Uh, the average grain size is, uh, is fairly uh, close, so not too far off and definitely within the parameters, if not of the immediate Michigan uh, dune sand. But, dune sand that we see in other areas. Um, but we are seeing that there are some larger rocks in the material and there are some finer materials as well. And so that indicates that the source of that sand was not originally a wind environment. It was probably deposited by water coming out of a glacial environment and the sorting was probably water sorting, which gives us this, this nice set of materials. So. Thank you very much. <laughs> Did you want me to say about Yeah. Okay, so I'll put on my other hat here and just heartily invite all of you to the Bruce Dice Mineralogical Museum at, uh, at lunchtime. This is about a 10 minute walk across campus and it looks like the sunshine is holding. So at lunchtime, that should be a nice uh, time to uh, do this walk. And the, the Mineralogical Museum has spectacular specimens of different types of uh, minerals there. Um, even if you're thinking, I don't know what a mineral is and why would I be interested in one of those, come for the beauty and you will learn a few things and you will not regret your decision uh, to come. So we have some student docents who are, are working there um, during lunchtime and also at the end of the day, right after the conference. 
And I have some maps of how to get there across campus, which I'll make sure that I are, they're set out at a, at a table here so you can pick them up uh, for that. It's a hard, uh, hard thing to know what you would do with your lunch with all these great options. So Perseverance Dune, you can just walk briefly, take a look at it, you'll be fine. Um, Ecosystem Preserve is a beautiful place, but you probably wanna spend a bit of time walking through that. And Dice Museum is another great uh, location for you to go to at lunchtime.